The second funnel week of the legislative session has ended. We've gathered a group of State House reporters to update you on what's passed, what's still alive, and what isn't on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Elite Casino Resorts is rooted in Iowa. Elite's 1,600 employees are our company's greatest asset. A family-run business, Elite supports volunteerism, encourages promotions from within, and shares profits with our employees. Across Iowa, hundreds of neighborhood banks strive to serve their communities, provide jobs, and help local businesses. Iowa banks are proud to back the life you build. Learn more at iowabankers.com. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you political leaders and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond, celebrating 50 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa PBS. This is the Friday, March 15th edition of Iowa Press. Here is Kay Henderson. If you aren't keeping track at home, this is the end of week 10 of the 2024 Iowa General Assembly. The group of people who are sitting at this table today have been there every one of those weeks, and we have assembled them to tell you what they've been taking notes on and what they've been reporting to you, the Iowa general public. Our guests today are Skylar Talal. She is the State House reporter for the Sinclair stations in Iowa, including CBS2 and Cedar Rapids. Stephen Gruber Miller is the political reporter for the Des Moines Register. Also joining us, Caleb McCullough. He is the Des Moines Bureau Chief for the Lee Enterprises newspapers in Iowa, including the Quad City Times. And Aaron Murphy is the Des Moines Bureau Chief for the Gazette in Cedar Rapids. Aaron, one of the things that happened in January on the first week of the legislature was the governor outlined her priorities. And one of her priorities was an overhaul of the area education agencies. That issue, that policy debate, has sort of sucked all of the oxygen available for debates about other things. How, where does that stand on, at the end of week 10? Yeah, it's also sort of ground to a halt as far as front-facing public debate. It was heavy early on in the session with public hearings and legislative hearings and, and new amendments and proposals coming out and, and that seems to have ground to a halt and uh, I think we're at the stage now where uh, the sausage is being made in the old smoke filled <laughs> back room now because we haven't heard about it in a while but but it is still very much dominating the session be, even from behind the doors. The Senate passed a version uh, that is very similar to the governor's proposal in that it changes the way out of committee uh, out, of, out of committee not off the floor um, that it changes the way that the AEAs are, are, are funded um, the house passed a version that went much less aggressive than the Senate version uh, kept keeps more of the current structure in place while while making some changes um, and so now uh, like I said those parties the three legs of the tripod have to come together and agree on one bill that, that they can all sign off on and that's what we're waiting to see. Yeah and I would say for folks who are uh, hopeful that something will happen or concerned that something will happen it is far too soon to say that the session is going to end without action on this. I think it's clear the House Speaker Pat Grassley told us yesterday he he thinks that they're having good conversations. Senate Majority Leader Jack Whitford said he thinks that they're hopeful that they can get something done so uh, we don't know what it will look like, but I think um, those two and, and the governor are, are hashing things out, and, and we may see action uh, in the coming couple of weeks. Well, and there are related issues here, because when the governor rolled out this policy proposal, she included in it her call to raise beginning teacher pay, and actually the pay also of veteran teachers who've been 
in the classroom in Iowa for at least uh, 12 years, Caleb. Yeah, and, and um, that's you know a fascinating way that this has all played out is that the, the House decided to run that teacher pay, their own version of a teacher pay bill separately, um, which ended up getting you know nearly unanimous support. Democrats were in favor of it, um, which obviously if that was in the AEA bill, they would not have been in favor of it. Um, whereas the Senate seems to be expecting to keep those, um, those two proposals together. Uh, and so, you know, wh whether we're going to be able to, to find uh, an agreement between legislators and how much to increase teacher pay and for whom um, is, is going to be, uh, you know, part of this discussion with those AEAs. And the Senate's given themselves the control here because they did not advance the House teacher pay bill separately. So that Correct. separate proposal is dead. If teacher pay is going to happen, the Senate's going to do it as part of that AEA bill. And Skyler, there were other elements in that teacher pay proposal that the House passed that were not in the governor's plan. Yeah, so there were, you know, some extra funds and things like that that went to, um, you know, help uh, support staff, um, you know, things like paraeducators, bus drivers, those sorts of things to try to get that minimum wage up for them to 15 bucks an hour. Um, you know, right now schools are having, you know, trouble finding those paraeducators and things like that, so they were trying to um, get that to help them. Speaking of schools having trouble, um, school districts have to put their budgets together. Um, what, what sort of predicament are they in? Because another element of this is um, by the early February, by law, the legislature should have decided on the general level of state spending per pupil, calculated on a per pupil basis for schools, and that's not done. And not only that, depending on when uh, you're watching this program, the deadline for schools to have their budget certified either just passed earlier Friday or passed a couple days ago. Um, yeah, it, it, they're way behind the ball. And what legislators keep telling us is that, and this ties back to how we talked about at the top, that the AEA thing is just consuming everything else in, in its orbit. The legislators tell us, especially in the Republican majority, that these things are all tied together because they're all school funding pieces, and so we, we have to figure them. We can't do just do one and then the other and then the other. They have to reach a collective agreement, and that's why we're still sitting here talking about school funding much later than we usually are. And it's another indication that they probably will be getting something done on AEAs because if they didn't feel the need to tie those things together, they could have already moved, moved on, on school yeah. funding. Well, let's talk about things being tied together or operating as separate planetary systems, Stephen. Um, th this session has sort of revealed a, a different legislative philosophy um, between the Iowa House, which is led by Pat Grassley, the Speaker, and the Iowa Senate, which is led by Jack Whitver, the Senate Majority Leader. Yeah, and I think those differences are always there. They're just particularly pronounced this year. Uh, and and the Everything in a nutshell happened yesterday when Pat Grassley gave a, a press conference and told, told everybody House Republicans have all of these priorities. We're really proud. We pushed them all through. We're, we're passing a lot of bills that we think are important. And we walked across the Capitol to a, a press conference with Jack Whitfer, the Senate Majority Leader, and he said, uh, here's the quote, we don't need that many bills, in my opinion, to make Iowa strong. They just don't feel the need to be passing as much legislation in the Senate. So we have seen a real flurry of activity. We've seen some late nights of debate on the House side, passing things that really got almost no consideration over in the Senate. So, Yeah, and, and we're hearing that from, Stephen described the conversation at the highest level of leadership. We're hearing that from the committee level leadership, that kind of frustration and disconnect between the House and the Senate right now, one side sending way more bills over to the other. So it's going to be interesting to see how that impacts the process moving forward. Now those committee chairs, their their workload lightens up now because of the funnels and their work is done. But uh, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out as we try to shut down the session in the coming weeks and, and months. And the bad blood has begun. You know, you, you hear grumblings from the rank and file yeah. lawmakers, well, the Senate didn't take up my bill. Mm -hmm. And you hear grumblings over on the Senate, well, the House sent me all these bills, but I didn't have any time to, to deal with them. So, you know, sometimes... Things dying in the funnel uh, allows lawmakers to focus on the priorities that remain. But if you kill too many things, there might be people who are looking for ways to get their priorities back on uh, on the agenda. And I think you, you saw that early in the session as well. I mean, going into the session, the House uh, was very public with um, these are our priorities. They had several of them, several policy bills and, and changes in that way. Whereas in the Senate, um, you know, Whitver, as, as we mentioned, really 
his main priority when he, going in was uh, tax cuts and accelerating and, and deepening those tax cuts that were passed last year. Um, and so, sorry, two years ago. And, and so, you know, we see that coming out where the Senate is less interested in kind of policy changes, major overhauls to various, you know, things that are happening versus um, the, the budget side. And I hate to bring this up, but as someone who's been covering the legislature since the last century, there is often a little rivalry between <coughs> the House and the Senate, um, and it manifests itself in different ways. Um, it doesn't matter sometimes if there are Republicans in both chambers or if there are Democrats in right. one and Republicans in the other, or Democrats in both. Sometimes they just don't mm -hmm. get along. And they, you know, are on opposite sides of the Capitol, <laughs> maybe for, for a reason. Um, <laughs> let, let's talk about this, what we refer to as the funnel deadline. Um, there are several of these during the session to sort of um, whittle away at the uh, total agenda that legislators will address um, as the session winds down. Um, Caleb, what in your view might have been the most notable thing to not advance by today's deadline? Yeah, I think one of the one of the big notable um, kind of a couple bills here re relating to education that came out of the House. Um, you know, they that was one of their um, priorities. They said going in was uh, take a look at our uh, higher and lower education standards and uh, processes. And so they had a bill um, for K-12 education that would have put curriculum written by a conservative think tank um, emphasizing conservative values into social studies education in the state. Um, that drew a lot of uh, uh, opposition from Democrats and from uh, history professionals in the state and national. Um, wrote in saying, you know, that was uh, going to take agency away from the state's teachers and, and professionals in uh, setting out curriculum. And so that did not advance in the Senate. And then um, another bill uh, looking at higher education would have uh, codified, codified some of the rules that the state regents set um, last year, rolling back some uh, DEI efforts at the state um, uh, public universities. And DEI is? Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, yeah. Um, and, and so the, and that would also have capped uh, tuition costs in the state. Um, so yeah, th those were some big priorities from House Republicans that didn't really get much of a hearing in the Senate. Skyler, what do you see as maybe a notable bill that failed this year? So one of the bills was in the House, actually, um, which would have raised penalties for um, terminating a pregnancy without consent. Um, now, this was kind of controversial because it changes language to death of an unborn person and would have actually outlined in Iowa code what unborn person means from fertilization. Um, this was something Democrats, you know, worried would impact IVF. Um, contraception and House Republicans, um, you know, didn't share those same concerns. However, whenever it, after it passed the House and went to the Senate, um, the Senate, you know, tabled it with IVF concerns. Um, so anybody else have some notables? The same senator who tabled that bill, Senator uh, Brad Zahn, uh, tabled another one uh, that had to do with immigration. And, and actually there was a couple of immigration bills. And this, this was fascinating to me. There was one that the Senate passed that the House didn't take up and, and then one that the House passed that the Senate didn't take up. Um, the Senate bill had to do with the E-Verify program and, and requiring businesses to verify, use that to verify that their workers are legal residents. The House bill um, addressed human smuggling. Um, there were some charities and, and, and uh, shelters that were concerned about that. But it was interesting to me because, you know, you talk about immigration as a topic and obviously that's one that Republicans very much rally around and, and are concerned about. About, and here you had the two chambers, each with an immigration bill, and, and the other side didn't take them up for, for whatever reasons, that, and they had each stated concerns they had with the bills. But that one maybe surprised me a little bit, just given that you would think a, an immigration bill going between two Republican-majority chambers would be shooting fish in a barrel, but for various reasons, those ones didn't pass. And Stephen, none of these bills that have been mentioned were on the governor's priority list. She gave legislators 19 bills that she wanted to see passed. Yeah, you're stealing my thunder. Oh. She had a lot of bills. <laughs> she had a lot of bills that she proposed this year, and I wanted to highlight a couple of them that did not make it through the funnel. One was the governor introduced a bill that would put definitions of man and woman into state law um, in ways that would allow uh, the state to separate transgender women out from other women in facilities like prisons, domestic violence shelters, things like that. It would also require transgender people to put on their birth certificates their sex at birth as well as their current gender identity. That bill was announced to much concern from LGBTQ groups. It got a committee hearing, but then it never was taken up on the House floor. 
And another priority of the, the governor's that did not advance uh, yet again was her proposal to expand birth control access. This is something that she's been trying to do since she got elected in 2018. Uh, she's several years now introduced these bills. The Senate has passed the bills a few times, but there's always been opposition in the House. You've seen, uh, I think Pat Grassley said, philosophical differences among Republicans, some of whom uh, have concerns about birth control, see it as uh, not a way to lessen abortions, but see it as a concern itself. And let me throw another one in here that may have surprised some people given um, how easily it passed the House. Um, it was a bill that would have expanded um, disability and death benefits for firefighters um, to cover any cancer-caused illness. And it was really spurred by the death of a Des Moines firefighter who passed away from um, a cancer that was not on the list. And so after his memorial service in February, that firefighter's family, his widow, and m dozens of firefighters came up to a House committee meeting. It passed easily, but it never was taken up in a Senate committee, and, and that has surprised some people. Any other surprises out there? I was just going to add to that. that. That one surprised me, too, and it's interesting, and I wonder, I've had the thought since that I, I, it, it, I can't help but feel, and I don't know if it's similar, but I can't help but feel parallels to at the federal level where they had to work really hard to get help for folks who had illness from cleaning up at ground zero after 9-11 right. and then more recently with soldiers who served near burn pits uh, overseas and I, I wonder if we're seeing something similar here at the state level I don't know it was an interesting one though any others I'll throw in one more okay. that was also on the governor's agenda uh, a bill to give state employees paid parental leave mm -hmm. when they give birth uh, will not advance. And it's just interesting because the governor has been trying to put forward this agenda that she's calling a pro-family agenda, saying that she supports life before and after birth. And there, there have been some of these proposals like birth control, like paid leave, that have just not gotten traction among her party. Um, and a couple of you were with me as we were interviewing a legislator about a bill that died, allegedly. And um, a member of the House said, well, as you know, nothing is ever dead in this building. So that is one that might be adapted and attached to another budget bill as the legislature sort of crafts budget. And some of these may be revived in, in some fashion. So um, turning now to one of the topics that has been um, discussed under the Golden Domes, Schuyler, school safety. A lot of debate time in the Iowa House spent on that subject. Well, yeah, and following the school shooting at Perry High School this past January, um, you know, House Republicans um, have really you know, wanted to do something to um, further protect students while they're at school. There's two bills right now that are currently alive. Um, the first one is, you know, teachers and staff would have to go through extensive training um, and then would, uh, would be able to carry guns. And I think the really interesting part here is that, um, you know, they would be given immunity from civil and criminal charges, which, you know, in the, in the past we've had some school dis districts who have wanted to implement, you know, these different programs, but they've had trouble finding insurance companies mm -hmm. that will cover them. And so this may be a way for, um, you know, Republicans to be able to bring those um, insurance companies to cover them. And that, that other bill that the House I passed maybe this past week, I don't know, the weeks are sort of running together, folks, <laughs> um, uh, introduced a, a technology I had never heard of, this technology, they're going to do a pilot project on it, that uh, gun sensing technology, if you have cameras in your uh, school, this software would be able to detect someone showing a gun within seconds and set off a, an alarm. Um, any, any surprises on how this school safety debate has played out? I think one of the things we've seen, I think, is is uh, perhaps expected political divisions between Democrats and Republicans here. Democrats very concerned about the idea that there could be guns in school buildings, uh, warning of risks associated with that. Republicans saying, listen, there's a lot of training involved here. Uh, we want to be careful. And it would also be up to the individual school district whether they want to have that policy. So. Those political divisions are playing out in the House. But then going back to the divisions we're seeing between the House and the Senate, Majority Leader Jack Whitfer was telling us yesterday, Iowa law does already allow schools to have policies that arm staff members. 
But as we, Skyler was just saying, they're having issues getting insurance and that's what's sparking these bills. And Another interesting piece of that, um, one of those school safety bills, was the uh, a grant program to uh, allow to, the state to pay for uh, schools to um, pay for guns and for training for teachers to carry guns if they choose to. Um, so that originally uh, would have dedicated three million dollars to that grant program. Um, that was eventually the dollar amount was taken out, but the grant program will still exist uh, if that bill does become law. So that would just be funded through the budget process. So we would we won't know uh, until later how much money will be dedicated for that if at all, but that has also caused some concern from Democrats. We have about five minutes left for our conversation. Stephen, um, the governor in January gave legislators a big tax policy plan that she wanted to see enacted. What's going on? Yeah, so the governor wants to, the centerpiece of this plan is essentially speeding up some of the 2022 tax cuts, which to remind everybody, brings Iowa to a flat tax rate of 3.9 percent by 2026. The governor wants to speed that up and take it down to 3.5% uh, next year and put some of those cuts in this year. Um, there are other parts of the bill, including lowering unemployment taxes for businesses, uh, lowering child care center taxes, that they property taxes that they pay. House and Senate Republicans have their own plan. <laughs> this is, you know, every year we see a couple of competing tax bills. They would like to eventually zero out Iowa's income tax altogether. Uh, I think, you know, they're going to really get started on this process, this negotiation process of what tax bill to do uh, really in the coming weeks here. Now that we're through the second funnel, they can focus more on the budget and on tax policy. So that's what we'll see. Skyler, a bill that cleared the Senate, um, it was actually the first bill passed, mm -hmm. um, didn't get a hearing in the House. What happened? Yeah, so that bill, just to kind of recap a little bit, would have allowed state agencies um, to hire private CPA firms to, um, you know, audit them instead of the state auditor. Um, you know, there was a lot of controversy there um, with Democrats. You know, he's the, Rob Sand is the only um, Dem elected to statewide office. Um, so Democrats were saying they were maybe trying to take some of, um, you know, his power away. But it ultimately came down to um, Republicans in the House thinking it would just cost too much. And the reason there being that, private accountants, CPAs, are going to charge more for those services, for those audits. Two than, approaching three times as much. Exactly, than, than, than the state auditor's office does. And so Skyler's absolutely right. It was interesting to hear this philosophical debate about separation of powers and political considerations, and then it came down to dollars and cents is why it died. Um, at this time uh, last year, the legislature had already passed and the governor had signed a major piece of legislation establishing state-funded education savings accounts for private schooling. Um, two years ago, they passed that major tax plan um, that reduced the state income tax. The governor could announce it to the nation as a, in response when she was asked to give the response to President Biden's uh, State of the Union speech. Um, what's law so far this year? There is literally one new law at this point, and step aside Iowa Farm Bureau because there's apparently a new lobbying superpower in the Iowa legislature, and that's the Lake Panorama Association because <laughs> they asked for a bill to help them regulate the, you know, their members' um, conduct on the lake uh, when they're boating, for lack of a better, that's the succinct way, and that's the only bill that's law right now. Well, moving from boating to voting. Oh, boy. Uh, like that segue? <laughs> uh, come on, people. Uh, so what do we know about the 2024 legislative work product right now and how that may relate to the general election debate as legislators run for re-election and others try to win seats in the House and Senate? Caleb? Yeah, I think we're seeing a pretty clear indication of that right now. I mean, the biggest issues in the 2024 20, election are going to be uh, the border, abortion rights, crime, and, you know, we're seeing these things um, play out in the legislature as well. I mean, one thing that we've already mentioned was that bill that um, some word would affect IVF treatments, uh, and, and, you know, that was stopped in the Senate. And, you know, you can't discount um, the fact that that's going to be a major focus of this election. Um, and so, you know, people are, I think, aware of, of, of what's going on in, uh, in the electoral process. And, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of bills dealing with uh, immigration regulation so that, uh, you know, lawmakers, when they go to the voters, can say, hey, here, we're working on, um, stop, you know, addressing the crisis at the border. Um, and, you know, same thing with crime. Uh, there's been uh, bills to address looting and organized retail theft. And so we're seeing a lot of that happen. And I want to add in two more. 
which have been pretty much annual focuses, education and taxes. I mean, the Republican agenda on education, they have passed some sweeping changes to Iowa's system. They have allowed uh, the state to give money to parents to attend, to have their st students attend private school. I think we can expect to hear about that on the campaign trail. Uh, they've passed a number of other education changes, and they have also, uh, on taxes, been cutting their those taxes, and I think we'll be hearing uh, the pros and cons of those things. Mm -hmm. And if, not that I suspect anybody really needs it, but if you need any confirmation that we'll hear about abortion and fertility <laughs> treatments, et cetera, on the campaign trail, uh, for those of us who reported on that this week, uh, it was not very long before we were hearing from Democratic State House members about how Brad Zahn may have stopped this bill, but he has a voting record mm -hmm. on abortion and personhood, et cetera, et cetera, in the past. So, and, and Brad Zahn in a, is one of those in a competitive state house district, too. So. Well, come Monday, we will all be back at the legislature hearing more about these and other topics. Thanks to all of you for joining us today and sharing your reporting. You can watch every episode of Iowa Press at iowapbs.org. For everyone here at Iowa PBS, thanks for watching. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Elite Casino Resorts is a family-run business rooted in Iowa. We believe our employees are part of our family, and we strive to improve their quality of life and the quality of lives within the communities we serve. Across Iowa, hundreds of neighborhood banks strive to serve their communities, provide jobs, and help local businesses. Iowa banks are proud to back the life you build. Learn more at iowabankers.com.